the CIA coined the term blowback. Blowback refers to the unintended consequences suffered by everyday, ordinary people through covert activity through their gun vote diplomacy. And therefore, I consider my family a type of blowback. And so talk to me, if anything, it's not about a family, it's not about me, it's a portrait of America. It's a portrait of America from Eisenhower's Cold War until the Trumpism that I now write about and talk about. Thank you. Next is Bill Darden, who is a composer from the U.S. Uh, so thank you so much to the whole Chittitella team for providing this space for us to share our work with one another. Uh, everyone here is just so inspiring, as you already heard, uh, just getting a taste, and I'm honored to be amongst you. I hope this short presentation gives you a little look into my creative practice, and that we can use it as a sort of springboard for discussions around the dinner table later. So let's jump in to my most recent work. In the last couple of years, I've been exploring often undesirable and overlooked artifacts of recording and playback technology. What got me interested in this is the simple fact that the majority of my work and the majority of people in the world who have listened to my work have done so through the medium of audio recordings, not live performances, just as we will today. And this fact has raised a lot of questions for me. For instance, what do recordings capture? Oh yeah, this is a YouTube sound uh, For instance, what do recordings capture and what do they fail to capture? Are they capturing the music or are we hearing technology's limitations and cultural belief systems? After all, how we record and what we record says an enormous amount about what we believe music to be. Most would agree, for example, it's not the sound of your neighbor sitting next to you unraveling a noise of unraveling a cough drop, or even worse, the sound of them snoring. <laughs> in early recordings, in particular, you can often hardly hear what today is considered the essence of the music. The most tangible element is more often the sound of the technology itself. And this puts into the re relief this fact that recordings are and will always be cultural, technological constructions, not accurate windows into time and space. In 2019, I wrote Soft Brown Wax for three trumpets, three trombones, electronics, and something I call augmented or feedback piano. Um, and this is something we can talk about some other time. The piece features an 1888 wax cylinder recording of a massive choir and orchestra performing Handel's Oratorio, Israel and Egypt in London. What's particularly beautiful about wax cylinder recordings and about this recording is how absolutely distorted they are. They become distorted after very little use. After about 50 plays, they're completely destroyed. This leaves the voices of those the recording is meant to capture almost completely erased. So let's listen to an excerpt of this 1888 wax cylinder recording. <laughs> so now I'm going to play for you a short two-minute excerpt of my piece song, Ground Wax. You'll hear the sound of the wax cylinder emerge towards the end. Thank you. 
Having grown up in the context of the Lebanese Civil War and uh, the perpetual state of war, my focus is very much centered on uh, questions of memory, uh, mm -hmm. histories, the personal, the collective, and ideas of women belonging. Um, the first project that I'm going to talk about is called Central Enemy. Uh, it's Arabic for Satan here. Uh, and this is a catchphrase that was used during the Lebanese Civil War and the Arabic radio to indicate that I'm extremely safe of this. Uh, and this brings us into this project, which deals a lot with memory and then the reconstruction of memory in relation to photography and history. Um, it looks at the sort of non-linear tangle of um, the intimate and the official, uh, and hopefully generate a space for uh, thinking of the collective and the work of um, When I moved to the US to graduate school, I took with me a, a, a bag of a collection of objects from my childhood, which consisted of drawings, newspapers, and things, postcards, old family photographs, uh, which I then made into a silver gelatin prints. Many of these are photographs, some are scanned by an activity that are layered to create composite images. But I was very interested in this whole the tactile process of making photographs, this mix of fact and fiction, uh, and how it all relates to memory and representation. Um, this later on led me to, to a, a curatorial project, which was much larger and which sort of Kind out of the Middle East and, and into the world, and looked at the most sort of experimental ways of representing war and conflict, uh, and away from photojournalism, which we all know is um, dictates the way that we understand war, the way that we sort of process memories. Um, 
And this, this show brought together photographers who were using light in the mechanical sense, light as a way of shedding new light on you know, new dimensions on uh, representations of war, but also using light in wartime conditions. So using like x-ray detectors, hard particle detectors, um, and sniper holes, uh, just conditions of war, which you know, could look like a condition very specific. Um, Another project is Nakam. So in my work, I also address uh, pockets of amnesia, um, the silences that settled in in post-war Lebanon uh, after the war sort of ended but didn't end. Um, and so a lot of uh, issues were swept under the rug, and one of them was the, 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 the people that went missing. You know, there were 17,000 people that went missing and were unaccounted for. So every year, we have demonstrations and families holding our photographs, which are just fading more and more every year. And I was very interested in um, the sort of lifestyle of a photograph and how the content no longer matters in the end. It becomes just a document and it becomes a testimony for the public access. Um, so what I did is I, I silk screened images of the missing, which were photographs that were just submitted to a public website onto uh, Arabic um, and I allowed them to crumble on their own face. And these are the images of people that went missing and I um, consider this somehow a, uh, a memorial for the missing in a way. Uh, it's also you know, the community of memory. Uh, an ongoing project that I'm working on is called The Book of Beirut. It's a documentary on another sort of minority that were very native to the Middle East, uh, the, the, the Jews of Lebanon, which I'm not a part of, but I grew up knowing about and never encountering until I went to New York and encountered the diaspora there. Um, and it, it looks at this landscape of belonging. Um, it looks at their sort of the complexity of their identity. Uh, within the sort of post war landscape of Lebanon. The images that we see now are basically synagogues that have been transformed into uh, homes, uh, to cemeteries. Um, these are old photographs of uh, Lebanese Jews in front of the cemetery. I traveled with uh, some uh, members of the community from Brooklyn back to Lebanon and uh, just sort of reactivated the history. Way of just conjuring the silence of the world. There's a trailer, but you don't have to show up. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a real pleasure for me to welcome. Nina Zonsky, it is her birthday today. He is our director's guest from the Ukraine. Very happy to see everybody. Thank you for coming here. And we are back to Chitala. I said we went back and came back to our home. We were in Chitala uh, more than a month ago and we arrived here two weeks after the war started. I'm sorry we have to continue the same topic, but the reality is as it is, the war is still going on in my country, very unexpected, very brutal, not hybrid anymore, but just a real war. And uh, so uh, we will have a very short presentation today, and I will just uh, read the first poem uh, that I wrote in Chitel. Actually, uh, it was the time when I decided that I need to keep the diary, I need to sing back, and to, to keep the memory of all those days and how it all happened. And the, the first poem was translated, it was published in New York, and it was written here on, on, on the very uh, first time. Of, Arriving from Chilitel. Shall I read it in English or in Russian? Война в день первый. Утром, когда за окном мистер Тиз засвистели ракеты, 16 человек в веселой пижаме, босиком, 
холодного пола, осеннего неба. Босиком по небу, что это эти страшные ракеты? Что это страшное? Это светлое. Летит над нашими головами в сторону мирного пути. Почему так дрожат прозрачные стопы? Прозрачная душа, почему она так дрожит? Как пришла война? Никто не просил плоти. Никто не стелил кровати, не накрывал стол, белоснежный кадр. Как фланцировать кадр брови на белом и белом полотне? Это война спросила она у тебя людей. Сихом, спросила она желание, какая грусть. Из ванны подстрашенная. Как не откроешь? Не могу еще ничем. Не надену на красивое платье. Не открывай, ответила ты. Не могу еще ничем. Не надевай, красивое платье. Если And I will read one more poem. His name is more the canon. And uh, actually it is that I'm reading on the background of our window, of, of the window of the forest's cabinet, which has a food with smile the hoofs of the windows so that we can protect, could protect ourselves from the explosion and from the pieces of glass. And we just, since we had some of our books in boxes, we decided that it can be a very good protection. And so this is, in the end, it just turned out to be symbolical and uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me to look at it because I, I remember how it all was. But these are the books of me and Warwick. And they, they, they really protected us. And when we were sitting in a small, Room. They, they said that during during the shelling you are supposed to be in the place where there are not many, uh, there is not much glass, and where ideally there are double doors so that you are protected because sometimes the window can explode just because the rocket hit nearby. And so we are sitting there waiting for the end of the fire alert, and just sometimes waiting, sometimes coming in quiet. So in the end of this one, there is just a list of, of, of the names of our books. Any Sabrayus Ekmin, Sabrayus Ekmin. It's a very exotic story, I'm not going to tell you. They came to me, young, fresh. They were just standing there, I remember. They were just standing there, 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 they were just standing и чтобы остались слова и буквы. Ты имеется в вами, в твоем, в сейчас. Стали на него, на руки, ей, одеть под меня, перешагнуть его, на твоей доме, всей твоей доме, в моем пространстве, на вещи, на своем, в семье. Всем здоровья. Next is Boris Kosansky, also a poet and writer, um, which I just basically. Hello, Mushenda, the people who pay the new pay, they start the speech to demonstrate his victory just and say, we are from Ukraine. So we are from Ukraine. I am 72, I am a university professor, I am a poet and uh, essay writer, and to tell in five minutes what I do, it is a good illustration to the expression to make the long story short. <laughs> <laughs> so, just give you an example of uh, my poetry. The number of books which we um, uh, published, you can imagine from the photos which are disappearing. And so disappearing our books very often. Yeah, it is maybe a thing. For a Kaichani Voini, a Puskai Sarobi Skalpi, Kaka Sanobi Moroni, Udanati Vite Printaji. Полезные бункеры, окопы и микрошейны, и главное, блин, да, потевался крат, 
которого раньше дали вещей через всю Европу, и где наш победный флаг без дырявля и осколков, и все же победный, где железный меч и щит начищены нервы, где доспехи, кольчуги и стрелы в кожаном колчане. Как нам теперь обходиться без этих предметов? Без воинственных предков и их советов, запретов, без железных птиц, проносящихся в жене. По окончании войны не знаю, что делать теперь. Хорошо, если брат ног постучится в дверь. Старую мать убьет, изнасилует дочь и сестрицу. Тогда-то и встанем плечом к плечу, и затянув ремень, с паями Европу пройдем и захватим вражду столицу. И навсегда внесем в календарь этот And next um, is a really special fellowship for me. We just started collaborating with the amazing Griffin Prize from Canada, which is one of the most important poetry prizes. And we're thrilled that each year they will send the winner of their prize to us. So Camisia Lubin is our very first um, from Santa Lucia, the country that I mentioned earlier, and she is our affiliated poet for the Griffin Prize. It's lovely to see you all. Thank you so much to everyone at Chibitana for this gift of time and space to create one of the most extraordinary panels. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. And of course, thank you to the Griffin Prize for facilitating all of this. Um, I work in the Black diaspora tradition of experimental literature. Um, and this excerpt that I will read, because I tend to think that poetry speaks multiple. And so it will tell you how I work and why I work, and also give you a sense of my sensibilities. Um, it is an excerpt from the book length poem that describes this, which is structured as a seven act play and splits the pronoun time in three ways and then gathers it up again in a figure called Tishri. And I, now the old woman, is blind with diametric ambition and restrict. The cicadic vice of the woodpecker, the great votive defiance of salmon or upstream, the false kingdoms of all required things. I let her trace my face into the palm, into terrain, so at least she will know where I have been, though I am no longer prostrate before a fool, some tropical birdfish in her drowned earth. Whose mother knew a woman once drunk on the words of vanished fishermen. In the biblical sense, if I could say, I'd speak you her name, Jeju, I'd oil the bodybuilder expert at Trombone and let you hear the expression she was so quick to utter, and let her pulse ribbon, the weekly diatribe with rainbows in the sun. How else to live? How else these leaps in logic against the god of sex with light, the god of sex? This generic panic makes me want to throw pain to a pain metallic grave. If I had not stumbled in this place, if homelessness to simpler condition for what I live, if for the people who live this still, who I now only glimpse through the window, myself wanting to pull over to give them coffee shave their chests, twist their hair into buns, or more elegant things. Needless that I should only have new money, or old, or whatever, to survive the I tell you again, I am not myself. 
I resemble a music box built for consolation, for our destiny interactions, for the mimic. JG, all of these words, microphone, the wordless, material, anyway. I am held within these claims, but I have kissed a lot of things, buried pets, eaten sugar from ice cream, endured first blood tests, made friends without benefits, and lost them. Found new ways of saying what is not ever enough to say. Ways to fish, to drink, to park, to burn, to burn into something new with this life. I have been careful too much. Disciplined to the extent of disremembrance, in frequent colors pissed into the wind. I don't remember when I decided to fold into myself, or when walking foot before foot to the feeding ground of murderous birds became the way to admit that words can be a giving up. Outcome of years, rearranging as such an alien star. And I have been called many things late at night. Green of grass, scientific utopia, dream of ancestry. What about rainy evenings? What about poltroons? The doomed cults full of hyper-rational people who miscalculated the height of doors. How many stairs are left? And when stood up on a tumble by the line of cars, by the romance of liberal consumption on the news. Anyway, any sharp thing is a short distance from possible to voluble. Father, what about a foot laid down hard on the gloss of a business suited? The testing words that remind me I am just as committed to expression as to freedom. It is better this way, or I would have no reason at all to write to you. But folds will deal sideways to my mouth. I to speak into you. Wondering what we might have become were we not so alive. Thank you so much. Um, next, in collaboration with the town of India today, we have Nico Manchevsky, the amazing film director from Macedonia. You'll be able to see one of his films downtown on Berkeley on Friday. And we'll also show a film on the course here. Um, well, Ago, I got an email from uh, Roberto Rafael, the director of the Venice Film Festival. Um, they were reaching out to people who have marked the uh, festival over the years. Uh, my first film, Before the Rain, played in Venice and it won the Golden Lion. And uh, so they, they thought I should be included in, in this group of filmmakers. Um, they asked uh, all of us, uh, a number of filmmakers, to uh, each make a, a tiny film, a short film, um, which was going to be shown at the uh, opening night of that year's Venice Film Festival, um, along with all the other short films. <laughs> The, uh, there were only two, two, uh, two conditions. One was that the film, all the films were supposed to be shorter than 90 seconds. <laughs> and the other one was that they were in some way, shape or form, uh, going to address the issue of uh, cinema of the future. So the first one was easier to do. <laughs> um, the second one was was a bit of a of a river. Uh, but um, sat down and, and started thinking, what is it? What is what is cinema going to be like 
20 years from now, 50 years from now, if it exists, um, what trends do we see today that are going to shape? And at that point, I thought that are going to shape image change rather than sin. Um, it might end up being a sad day, but um, maybe we're not, it's not going to be seen as a um, So anyway, that, that summer I um, had a few filmmaker friends in New York join me in making this little piece. We shot it in New York, edited it, and it was inspired by a video I saw on YouTube, which then sort of opened the, the gate to this, this story, which then clicked with the request we did. Um, so I showed it and edited it in, 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 in New York and uh, sent it to them. It was screened um, together with all the other films by filmmakers that I was only honored to be to be next to like Pertinucci and David Ferrara. Um, then uh, after that I just basically picked up the film and uh, posted it as a separate individual short film called Thursday. There's no uh, particular reason why it's called Thursday not Wednesday or Tuesday. <laughs> um, I just thought Thursday was was fun. The, the least poetic of a, of a name of the day. Um, so uh, here's Thursday, it's, it's, it's very short. Hi everyone. Um, what a gift it is to be here and to get to know all of our fellow artists, the wonderful staff of Tikitala, and the artists and faith in you all in the time to come. Um, I write uh, predominantly in creative nonfiction, so I'm sure you know this, but predominantly in creative nonfiction, and even I would say in a form of speculative nonfiction, which is a form that I love precisely because of the appearance of the to me. Nonfiction, so probably that actually happened, but it's in encompassing dreams, wish, memory, imaginings, everything that didn't happen before. I feel the way to imagine what is the past and what can still be. I like the way the form acknowledges that imaginings are, in fact, part of what happens and part of how we narrate ourselves into being. Now, I am a lawyer by training, and in a previous book, I taught for years in 
And so it might be wild to be so interested in speculation, but I was thinking about the way that we sometimes pretend that there's trial to the background and enterprise and really know that they did come into stories, something that produces narrative. I needed my interest in how to tell a story that peels back the shell of the and shows what went into that narrative fight. Um, whether it was, it's possible to tell a story in other ways that simultaneously inherits its own story. My first book, The Back to the Body, was in part about the Louisiana murder of Jack Williams, the investigator, in part a memoir of Colin Hamlin, and very much a Past in our societies, in our families, and in ourselves. So then, it is something that disrupts the narrative, which is that I came out as trans while I was on the book. So suddenly, I had a different me than the book, and that which was on the book that was called Me and the Book, and it was called Me and the Book. And I was sharing one story in my life, while at the same time also speaking quite publicly about a story in my life that had always been in there. And it's something I was young, but that I hadn't chosen to be part to be public about. So, what really constituted the narrative of me, right? What really went into the narratives of all of us? How much do we share? How much do we reveal? How much do we hide away? And how much is shaped by what's possible for us in the narratives we see in the world around us? How much is that been shaped by the fights, the narrative of history? So, um, I decided, of course, that like many of us in this room, I work out things through art. So that led to this book I'm looking at now, Vulcan Nider. Vulcan Nider is a mix of memoir, cultural analysis, history of the gender binary, what I'm calling trans reimagines, and an international road trip you know, gender binary, with the manuscript to the publishers in 2023, right being a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cover that. So this is the French artist, whose home in the archives for that winter fall. If you know anything about Charles Darwin or the Claude Assembly, you know that this woman. However, in their memoir, in their own writings, they are very clear about the gender binary. So, what got written over? What was restricted in terms of what was possible? Gender and genre, of course, share a deep meaning of a type of kind. And so, it had always seemed necessary to me that to make a trans I must make a trans genre book. And so, the book retraces the history of the gender binary. But it also takes figures who transgender in their own way, in their own time, and reimagines them to life in the world. And speculative scenes. And these are some of those figures. Which is a long way of saying that in the book, Bob and I do what we drink in a trans bar, because it's a community. And it doesn't really matter that Claude is a ghost, period. Or, as I put it in the text, and I'll just read the text, I'll just read the paragraph and post it to the this is a book about struggling to live as you are when there is no narrative for that person, no role to suit, no story for your story, and discovering that all along there was such a narrative, this one you never knew. This is a book about history that was left out and omitted from history, at least any of the history I learned, and maybe that we did too. This is a book about needing to look outside yourself to understand who you are and find the courage to see beyond the possibilities that have always presented themselves to you. And it begins with a kind of exit. Not just one place, but many. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next is Curtis Rock. Uh, he also has an affiliated fellowship from one of our architects uh, who was here several years ago, William O'Brien, who funded. Uh, and one architecture fellowship should be here. And I think some of you will remember the path that the next times of installation they've done. He comes to us to conceive of, construct, and dismantle in six weeks a project here. So welcome to Chris. Thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for the chance uh, for me to come here. Uh, as Dave mentioned, I'm coming up with and I need to use these two images a lot to introduce what I'm interested in with regard to architecture. These are two depictions of an architecture office in Detroit from 1942. The author called Albert Kahn and Associates. And the, the photograph that you see on the left is a group of draftspeople people who are producing in that moment the, the, what would 
would be the largest building in the world. It's a bomber factory in Ilo Road in Michigan. Uh, and this building was so large and required such a degree of precision that they had to develop like sort of entirely new ways to produce those drawings. So you're laying on the table, new techniques, and new technologies for that drawing. And in the image that you see on, on the right hand side of the screen is the plan of the office during that time and all of the technological infrastructure which had to be installed in the office in order for people to be able to work in this way. So either air conditioning systems, uh, telephone systems, telephone lines, telegraph systems, etc. So we oftentimes think of like architects as producing buildings, but in order for buildings to exist, you first have to have all of these sort of really vast and sophisticated networks of technologies, uh, labor protocols, uh, and flows of materials, which allow buildings to exist in the first place, and sort of that's what I'm, what I'm interested in with regards to architecture. Um, in my creative practice, I tried to develop uh, systems that allow me to like work with people, optimize people around the world in order to produce different kinds of things. And I would say that before the pandemic, this work was mostly digital, so it was a lot of like software that I would write that would allow me to collaborate with people, um, or like multiplayer video games. This was a video game where you would compare different rocks to strangers online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so since the pandemic, though, I, I got really interested in sort of working remotely with people in order to produce physical objects. Um, and oftentimes this involves like designing uh, software through which we would relate to each other, but also machines that would allow that work to be produced. And so, for example, this is a machine that drips paint out of these canisters. Uh, in order to produce these very large, like three meter panels, which are made by anywhere between like 15 and 30 people uh, all at the same time, and they build up just for the depth of the paint kind of layers on these panels uh, over time. Uh, I worked with a group of people uh, through this software, which was called um, Mouse It was a software that became really uh, important during the pandemic because it was basically something you would install like on your employees' computers in order to track their gestures throughout the workday so that you could like monitor their attention uh, and their productivity. And so we were kind of misusing this software in order to basically to kind of choreograph our gestures uh, simultaneously around the world uh, as a way of, kind of controlling um, the machine. So these are sort of some of those examples. But um, so over the last few years, I've been building a host of these machines and a host of these properties. This is a vendor that would like aerosolized ink in these clouds uh, and then be packed with paper in different ways. Um, basically, all, all these, it, it kind of involves some like really precarious, really delicate material condition that I then like, uh, put here kind of group of people around. So um, the most recent of these, uh, which I'll kind of end with, is this machine that I was working on before I came here, and it's basically a way to kind of compress like 10 colors of paint into a single droplet, um, and then you can like aggregated kind of painting over the course of weeks by like building up these droplets uh, on the surface itself. The marks on these um, paintings were produced by an artificial intelligence, which I trained with a group of the people that I worked with. And so uh, we trained them by like teaching them our unique gestures. Uh, and then it allowed them to kind of draw with like hybrids of my gestures. So like my gestures and somebody else's gestures to produce the mark. Uh, and what interests me, I think, about this work is that it allowed me to kind of like track the participation of everyone involved in the piece from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and it's actually led to a kind of like uh, cooperative governance structure which surrounds each of these pieces where they're kind of collectively owned and we make uh, as a group like decisions about how the work is sold, uh, what kinds of work we produce, what happens to money after the piece is sold, and things of that nature. Um, so these are some of those. Uh, and as Dana mentioned, um, I'm uh, uh, in the next two weeks, or I guess in four weeks, I'll be putting on the project. Uh, so I'll give you a brief example uh, of a kind of mock-up which I sent several weeks ago to Diego. But I have been working for a while on this computer that uses bubbles uh, in order to basically sense the qualities of the kind of interior atmosphere, so things like humidity, uh, air pressure, turbulence, and so forth. And then he used that to make predictions about the weather uh, inside the room. Uh, and so, uh, 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 some version of that will probably happen. Thanks. Thank you. Can you see what I mean? That's so cute. Osako Serizawa is a writing fellow, um, again, an affiliated fellowship. We collaborate with Penn, uh, the international organization to protect and promote. Uh, writing against censorship and other issues against journalists and writers in general. So it is a joy to have you with us. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm working on a quartet of fiction, essentially in 1952, and Japanese imperialism in the context of um, European and American imperialism. And I'm very interested in the, the narrative of history, how history is constructed and used. So each book sort of approaches this history from a different angle, um, geographically and perspective wise, but also formally and statistically, um, to essentially challenge um, the official and popular ways that this history has been told and understood, both in that job, um, and you know, uh, all this sort of versus this sort of lucky way that, that has been experienced and remembered and passed on um, across generations and territories. Um, so I'm going to read a tiny sliver from the first book, a little section of a, of a piece called Pain to Pardon. Um, it's written from the perspective of a perpetrator, um, and the narrator, the first person uh, narrator, is a Japanese research doctor who is especially employed to China to a place called Pinkhorn um, by the Japanese military during the Second World War. The piece is written in sort of split elliptical structure. Um, but this is going to streamline, so you won't notice this is not clear. Um, you'll also hear the word manka, which in Japanese means law, um, like one word. This is one change of that. All told, I spent 24 months in being found. Officially, there was a boy in the QC, the anti epidemic water sanitation unit, unit 731, the defensive research unit. Materially, the pain plants and 300 hectares is for a land dappled with forests and meadows. Its innumerable structures luxurious <coughs> and accommodate within its hold. Both leave the bananas along the mill, a pair of industrial chains continually emptying into an enemy sky. I do not know who came up with the term money. Possibly its usage preceded us, but by the time we were given full reign over our research, we were using the term counting up the beds, telling me no monitor, in, pre in preparation for our next delivery. I was asked to accept such a delivery just once. Woken abruptly, I was summoned by an officer waiting in the night of the Throughout the ride, I was weary, my mind helped me to sleep, and once I gleaned the purpose of the trip, a preliminary health scan, I shut out the uh, chatter and arrived unprepared for the secluded station. The small squadron of military guards patrolling the length of the curtain train, the delivery white tarp peeled back to the uh, revealed 12 prisoners strapped to planks and gagged by that place. My first reaction was more than fascination, my mind unable to resolve an image of these people packed like this, and the term Malika acquired a very vivid vividness that struck me. I began to laugh. A sudden sound that elicited a disproving glance from the officer who pressed me forward. How they managed to survive, I could not imagine. Trembling with exhaustion, they lay in their thin prisoners' clothes, wet and stinking and they are nearly embraced, until one by one they were unfastened, forced to stand, their movements minced by the shackles that still bound their hands and feet. No one protested, the only shouts coming from the guards as they stripped in front of them, exposing them first to the cold, then to the water, as a pair of soldiers closed them down. Had I been able to, I would have abandoned my post, and perhaps the made as if to do so. The officer gripped my arm, his flaccid face, niched by repulsion, but it was unclear from who he what. As the water dripped away and the money dropped the towel up, I was led to the nearest plank, where four women, my manacled together, sat children. They were all in their twenties and thirties, their eyes black with illumination, and their chattering bodies so violently painful that the cold and the hardly covered them. The second time was an all male group, each man, wiry with work, irradiated by humiliation so kindly my hands began to shake. The third and final time was a mixed group, perhaps stunning. One woman who was so agitated by my attempts to minister to a little girl. But I barely registered the man I pulled from the train and added to the problem. This new prisoner was my age, and good health and spirited enough to have risked the curtains to spy from the train window. He was brought to me to be tranquilized, and though I must have complied, I remember nothing else. 
from the near and heat of the soldiers snapped to attention to find me, and then later in my vain mood, but the next day I stepped into my ward and did not recognize the same place. Now, Bernard, I don't believe anyone is so naive. Jose Manuel Salando is a composer from Argentina. Nice. Um, good evening to everyone and thank you very much for, for coming here. And many, many thanks to Chilitera for this wonderful opportunity. Not only for all personal experience, but again, I want to remark that it's amazing to, to meet all these the other fellows, which is a wonderful group. Thank you very much. Well, I'm a composer from Argentina, and because my English is very bad, I can do it. And I can do it very well. At least, I can do it. Well, several of my musical interests are the gradual change that formed us, the constant between different kinds of music textures, uh, especially between heterophonies, paraphonies, similes, and shortcuts. I like to search for situations where those different kinds of textures can be established or articulated by just one of one change in the materials. I mean, I like context where a minimal change can be very significant. Another aspect is the production of small moments of ambiguity or quality within each kind of textures. By other hand, the musical form is the consequence of this continuous change, like a rhapsody or a fantasy, more like in a dream, when all the changes are con constant, but also apparently disconnected, when they are fully connected by small filaments in all and new elements, in all cases, three forms. Melody is an important aspect of the music, the, the melodical tensions and the different kinds of phrases are structural, but it's also very important how it change in terms of color, velocity, opacity, thickness, or distance, among other parameters. The character of my music uh, revolves around some ideas about nostalgia, melancholia, and evocation from music from different eras and composers, but always in a poetical way, and by way of fables, memories, and fantasies. I use real and fake evocations, citations or quotations from different kinds of music uh, from, from the past and the present. Which the uh, music which I love, they are superior or French composer, or um, music of Serata from Prada, or Carlos Suave Schindauer and Felicia Pendebrez, uh, to the music of Schubert, this or Dios, many contemporary music which I cannot mention here and in, in any political space because I, don't, I, I will have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to show you a short piece, it's a miniature, it's a three minute piece. I saw uh, voices uh, for 24 uh, BBC voices. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
me, I'm a short person, but thank you very much. I think that really that's the scale of the installation I have in our gallery space. Um, this is another printmaking installation project I did um, called Virtual City of Thousand. I used a thousand hand printed screen printed paper cubes uh, stacked up to portray a city landscape. Um, where I grew up um, has a lot of high rise building. I grew up um, in a more different, different city in South Korea, but I lived in apartment buildings almost entire my life until I moved to the state, which is the late 20s, uh, 2015. So I set the cubes and then they look like city. But when you look at the work in the bird's eye view, it's actually functional QR code. Um, mm -hmm. Adding another elements from the city environment, I wanted to portray um, virtual and physical uh, relationship in the world we're living in, especially in you know, these days. After the pandemic, we were really living in virtual and digital work at the same time. Sometimes it's very very You exist in both spaces. So um, yours um, can scan the work from the bird's eye view, and then they receive themselves um, on the device. If you read the code on the phone, you're going to see yourself because there is a, a camera hidden mm -hmm. in the ceiling mm -hmm. and constantly taking photo and then send the photo to your the page you're going to read with the code. So that's how you see yourself um, on your device, physically and virtually. So this is another thing. So um, what I like about this project, whenever I have a show, I send the cues, and then the people who are there, they step. So it always comes up with a different um, shape of the scene. Um, how so this is the uh, New York City I have, and I love the another like a pretty landscape behind my work. Um, and I sometimes even want to show my two projects together. Um, this is how things are consumed, is another project um, using food production. This time I have highlighted how we consume food instead of how foods are made. And then um, it represents, it shows um, like fine dining and the best food presentation. Um, this design shows how French fries are made. <laughs> so the digital prints um, I have here is an actual walk for days. So um, you can walk through the artwork and then more deeper they're in, you're going to see um, the work less actually. Um, and then, so you can see some of the shadows. Inside the maze, there are two different food presentation, fine dining re uh, restaurant and the best food. They are all um, made by me and then we design uh, for the, to replicate the best food dining system. <laughs> this is a um, white video that I did um, in 2021. And then while I'm here, I actually researched all the European railroad data for the last two years, and then that's what I'm going to do. Three more presentations to go. So here we go. Next is Anna Sokolovic, composer from Serbia. It's uh, amazing to be here in the garden. I was born in Yugoslavia. Now this part is called Serbia. I had a very beautiful childhood, which was uh, impregnated by different art disciplines. I practiced classical ballet, music, and theater. And then eventually, I became a composer. All these different living arts really deeply determined my love for the stage uh, from its different sides. Today I'm writing concert music for nothing to see, <laughs> from solace to orchestra. 
also music for dance and many hybrid uh, things around. And I went to office, uh, which put somehow all my plans together. In 1992, during the absurd practice of the war, I immigrated to Canada, to Montreal, where I have been since. Considering myself as an alert European composer, who never been a minute time, I arrived to the society with a strong, how strong was I in perception? And being physically separated from my country, so seeing myself in a different context, I started to understand my own cultural DNA and its riches. It's quite amazing uh, needing to move to Canada, to North America, to understand my own roots. Anyhow, at that moment, I understand, understood better what Charles said. If you want to be universal, start by painting your own village. So little by little, I started to use musical idioms and some other idioms, balance. Some of them are connected, actually, connected to the Serbian language as music. I'm particularly interested in the in musical characteristics as a rhythm, intonation, notes, and not in the semantic context, the notations. Through this exploration, I started to have interest in other languages, and I am continuing to do this kind of research. I wrote many vocal pieces using different languages, including English, French, uh, German, Italian, Latin, etc. But also other languages I was less familiar with, like, let's say, Indonesian, Medina, Irish, Arabic, Tifu which is the language, one of the three languages in the world. Languages are dialects, and dialects are for me the spices of the world, and we have to preserve them if we want to have a world which is not tasteless. So let's. Uh, here, one minute and 15 seconds, <laughs> opening of my opera, Sun Valentine's Wedding, in Sweden. Mm -hmm.
expanding that vision, that executing on their dream. If you just saw it, this is a man here in the spirit of fellowship and attitude. Although I can't lie, I'm nervous about um, sharing a piece just for a week in total. Um, I've been waiting to write it for some years, and I guess I need space in between the thing and not sharing it to you. So it's part of the collection of lyric essays, uh, and I think this one's going to be many parts. So this is what I have in part one. I will kill you not today, maybe tomorrow. My journey to James Baldwin's house in San Paulo once had a circuitous and inauspicious start. Late November 2013, I was attending a conference organized by the literary journal Kalalu at Oxford University. I traveled there with my friend Larry and he said, we all journal my heart. And as we often do, we're sharing a room this time, a pocket size, a common room at the Royal Oxford Hotel, a heartiness neo Georgian edifice right by the railway station. The day I was slated to speak, I woke up to find in my inbox an email with the subject line, quote, thank you for making us visible, video LGBT, unquote. Bill of bad tidings, I must thought and harbinger of what I plan to say that very afternoon on Ethiopian Ethiopia. Still then, and very ugly, my heart still asleep beside me, I prop myself up, flushed with curiosity and corroboration, I began to read the letter. 
Dear God, Mom, a story about you being gay is circulating the field of social media networks and causing a huge problem. I am not sure whether you are gay or not, but I have seen that you are well engaged in LGBT studies. Just wanted to let you know that the story is making us Ethiopian gays more visible. It's repeating debates about homosexuality in Ethiopia. The your center as a highly educated person contributes to the Ethiopian LGBT community a positive view, accepting you act very much. If you are gay, then I applaud you for your courage. If you are not gay, then thanks for the publicity. <laughs> I hope it has harmed you in any way. Thank you. P.S. Below are the links to the drinking story. <laughs> It was immediate how I became alert. While my body clenched up to brace for the disaster hidden in those hieroglyphic links, my mind centered then launched into somersaults and cartwheels over the message itself. Oh, what? A story about who? Uh, me? A what? An uproar? Harm in my way? And why is the message unsigned? Who is this? It seemed no kind word in the email. The appreciated address, the testimony, the kinship, the appreciated praise, none of it. And all my mind's frantic beeping or ease my flight. I read and reread the note, reminding myself that I knew the city to come, and in fact had rehearsed it countless times in my mind. Although all scenarios of confrontation and conjure were transacted face to face with words or blows or both netted out in person. I'm sure I muttered a snippet of a prayer my late father was every morning of his life. He had got some suffering, 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 suffering. Lord. Spare me from evil eyes and evil schemes. Spare me, spare me, O oh Lord. Or perhaps it was my late aunt's blessing I prized most and committed to memory. Whosoever comes dashing to harm me, may our lady Mary bring them down to their knees and send them back to peace. Words turn to prayer, turn to honor. It seemed a lifetime before I clicked on the first link, and when I did the heading flash, his daughter, Daiman Mushet, had spoken in the Below it, my face frozen, an embedded video of an interview I did on the television business of war. Among other things, where I talk about all men's life and work as if they were my vital signs. Although I didn't go to my own queer sexuality in the interview, I talk openly about his and quiet as it's kept mine. A few days later, someone else would add right below the video room as if to resolve any doubt, an excerpt from a piece I've written years before in which I'm not signifying but addressing my sexuality head on as a matter of fact, or to be precise, as a matter of love, language, and longing. Oh, I write in such a tongue. English I learned after a heart had shaped my tongue's first memories, but to both a heart and English I am a stranger. It's an insight I learned a few years back in tongue collapse as I came out to my mother who could not register here for homosexual. I could not translate either turn in a part or make real approximations. Open word lives don't exist in my mother's tongue. Though epithets do, I've come too far to return to the dreads from the source to name something new. Then follow a cascade, no, an uproar of comments, mostly epithets and death threats, one of which to this day I cannot seem to hear. I will kill you, not today, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Thank 
I hope you can help me. And I want to thank our nominators, the people who were nominated. Um, I want to thank our juries for doing an extraordinary job. Um, and our staff, how we curate the truth. Um, I feel like we brought the world here tonight into this room. The whole world, its issues, identity, wars, uh, all the things that unite us in this moment. So thank you to the fellows, thank you to the staff, thank you to everyone watching us out there on Instagram. And uh, we'll see you soon, I hope, for, for the presentations. Thank you. Thank you.